Thanks everybody for joining us for this month's webinar, which is entitled, What It Takes to Be an Innovation Leader. Interestingly, in the 30 years I've spent in this space, I've had the pleasure of seeing lots of product teams improve their position after adopting an outcome-driven mindset. Uh, but only on occasion have I had the pleasure to work with executives who successfully transformed not just one product team, but an entire company by aligning the actions of the organization around the customer's outcomes. One such example is the medicines company, which is led by today's guest, Dr. Clive Meanwell. Clive was the founder, chief executive, and chief innovation officer of the medicines company, which was acquired by Novartis early last year for over $9 billion, which is at a 41% premium that he attributes, at least in part, to the company's outcome-driven mindset. Prior to that, Clive was a partner at the venture capital firm MPM Capital. He has also held senior executive positions with Roche and is trained in medicine with a postgraduate specialization in cancer treatment and research, clinical trials, statistics, and epidemiology. Today, Clive is executive chair and founder of Population Health Partners, a global investment firm whose goal is to fund solutions that effectively prevent and treat the seven most common health conditions at prices that are more affordable for people and more sustainable for healthcare systems. His goals and history of success make him a unique innovator and a leader in the pharma industry. With that, please welcome Dr. Clive Meanwell. Clive, thanks for joining us today. I really appreciate you being here. Well, it's a great uh, pleasure, Tony. Thanks for inviting me. I'm glad to see you. Pleasure as always. Uh, Clive, I thought it'd be great if you could kick things off just by talking about uh, the medicines company uh, and your start of that company. You know, what, what problem were you trying to solve? And just give us some idea of your mindset and you know, how you uh, approach your career. Well, it's, it's quite a long time ago now that we, we embarked on that journey. Uh, I was a young executive out of a big Swiss pharmaceutical company, a, a rather excellent one called Rush, where I'd been responsible for drug development processes, as well as regulatory affairs and uh, uh, drug safety and some marketing. And uh, it, it, it seemed to us, as it seemed to the entire industry at that time, that we were not being as productive as we wanted to be. Our timelines were slower than we wanted. Our uh, costs were already then escalating. Our market uh, marketability metrics were, uh, but for a few blockbusters, uh, you know, patchy at best. And it was a time of great globalization. So suddenly we were faced with all sorts of uh, growth challenges where Japan and the US and uh, Europe needed to work much more closely together in a large organization. So um, I did a lot of work on what was then called business process reengineering. I did a lot of work on uh, portfolio management. Uh, I, I'm not sure how successful I was. And uh, although Roche has went on to thrive, I'm glad to say, I left Roche because I felt changing um, the large organization was a challenge that was going to be beyond me for the next uh, 10 years. And I wanted to try and uh, start a brand new company, uh, which had the goal of making product development more efficient, um, it, therefore allowing you to extract more value from technology assets. Uh, that, that was what I wanted to go and do, and I managed to get some venture capital backing to launch the medicines company to do that. Well, when you started down that path, what were some of the first challenges uh, that you faced? And I know we talked before about your view of uh, and inside out approach versus an outside in approach. Uh, can you talk about some of the challenges you face and how that mindset either helped or hurt your, uh, your, your company? Well, I think uh, back in the uh, uh, late 90s, early 2000s, the, the pharmaceutical industry had not yet broken through in terms of the, the unpacking of biology that we now have uh, enjoyed in the last 10, 15 years. The, the, the human genome product project was still going. We didn't understand uh, uh, the genetic basis of disease as well as we do now. We didn't understand some of the pharmacology that we now understand. Uh, but yet we were very technology led as an industry. Um, you know, large companies with large uh, research laboratories inventing you know, still more molecules for uh, targets that were not very uh, user-friendly, if you like, uh, more to do with 
what could we do in the laboratory rather than what would we do in the in the doctor's office or the patient's home? And so it's always been as an industry uh, since it came out of chemistry, a, a, a left to right industry for the large part. The research guys have to come up with something wizard and then the regulatory guys have to get it approved and the marketing people then have to pick up the bat take on the baton and market it. And that left to right thinking, um, which is, is essentially what I think you mean by, um, um, you know, inside out, um, I think <clears throat> got us some part way to solving some of the big healthcare problems of our age, but uh, ultimately it's very limited because you're not really solving the problems that uh, are out there. So um, the whole industry, I think, has gone through this cycle and uh, continues to struggle with the, the technology lead rather than the uh, sort of mindset of, well, what do we really need to get done here uh, in, in healthcare? That leaves it largely, um, uh, you know, innovation uh, to luck, right? Because you have to discover the molecule that's going to achieve the outcomes that you're trying to achieve without knowing the outcomes you're trying to achieve, right? So it's kind of putting the cart before the horse. I always felt that, you know, drug discovery was kind of a guessing game, right? Where you, you're coming up with solutions and then seeing if there's, if they can solve a problem. Um, was there a particular moment that you realized that, uh, there must have been a, must be a better way to go about uh, this process. I'm not sure there was one moment, but there was a good story around a moment. I, I was uh, utterly intrigued by what Boeing were doing with document management systems at the time. I was heading up uh, a chunk of uh, Roche, and I went. I got myself invited to Seattle to go and see them, and I was there for three days. And indeed, they did have good document management systems that I was very interested in bringing across to, to, to the pharma company that I was working in. Um, however, on the second day, I was having lunch in the staff canteen and I was introduced to a, an engineer from Germany uh, who actually worked for Lufthansa. My assumption at the beginning was that he was like me, a visitor, until I found out in the conversation that he, he was actually in Seattle for five years with his family embedded in, in, in a program of engineering at uh, Boeing as, as sort of a, a real life problem solver, uh, trying to think through with the Boeing team, you know, what the real world problems would be. So while obviously Boeing is a brilliant technology company and have led the world for many, many years, the idea to me that we could perhaps involve uh, people who make big decisions um, in solving real problems into teams might, might be important, but still today, pharma doesn't do that. It's very difficult to do. Uh, we still are thinking a lot of the time left to right. It's, it's much better than it was. I think our industry has progressed dramatically in the last 25 years, but there's still a tendency to come up with a wizard technology idea and then figure out whether there's a market for it. Yeah. Well, you did things differently at the medicines company and, you know, you use that uh, outside in or right to left mindset. And that's, that's a big shift in mindset. Um, what were some of the challenges that, uh, that you faced and that the organization faced as, as you try to move them uh, from re left to right uh, to that right to left mindset? Well, there were some things that uh, big pharma has always done extremely well, and we didn't have any of those advantages to bring with us. For example, scale, uh, low cost capital, and lots of it, um, global reach, um, massive technology uh, capabilities. So I missed all of those things day one, and it was quite clear that we would have to uh, develop those capabilities on, on a much smaller scale. Uh, but, but on the other hand, that did provide an advantage because we had to find a way uh, to look at the, you know, our business model, uh, which was to take strategic misfits from Big Pharma. Uh, there are many assets uh, in Big Pharma portfolios that are not suitable because of their scale and size and, and the way they work. And we thought that we might be able to take some of those assets by licensing them in, develop them, and then uh, enjoy the, uh, the growth that you could drive from them. And that's what we did. So we, but, but of course, we moved into the hospital business at a time when Big Pharma was moving out of the hospital business. And you know, I think our creation of a company, growth of the company was gratifying. Uh, it could never quite be on the scale of a Big Pharma company, but 
uh, our ability to take a blank sheet of paper and ask the question, uh, for example, in the cardiac cath lab where we really cut our teeth, uh, what really needs doing here was a fascinating one. Uh, there were technologies, for example, for blood thinners that could uh, lower the chances of a patient having another heart attack during their heart attack procedure. And uh, these were very powerful blood thinners. Uh, and everybody wanted them to be ever more powerful. Uh, you know, ever, the technology should be uh, more and more. It's sort of like the steam shovel story of Christensen or something, or, 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 or uh, discs uh, storage. Uh, everybody wanted a more and more potent drug to get more and more thinning of the blood quicker and quicker. But what people had forgotten was that um, the real problem of managing patients with heart attacks is speed and throughput and the ability to get them out of the uh, OR, out of the recovery unit quickly. So we knew that, uh, and we knew that the big impediment to that was actually bleeding, which is, the, which is a safety problem, not an efficacy problem. And so we focused the development of a product called Angiomax onto what would it take to give adequate blood thinning fast? I mean, we, we were not giving up uh, on that idea, but in a way which really changed the outcomes of, of the patients and, and the hospital's process, which was getting them done quickly, mobilizing the patient quickly, not having them bleed, and, um, and obviously, therefore, improving the patient's outlook. It turned out that bleeding was an incredibly high risk factor for further death risk. It turned out to be that bleeding was more important than having another heart attack in terms of your survival. But then in addition for the institution caring for the patient, that their throughput would be improved. I remember going to a very uh, busy hospital in Kentucky pretty early on in this and sitting down with some nurses who were staffing the unit that was caring for these patients as they came out of their angioplasty and, and went um, into recovery and then back to the normal ward before often being discharged the same day. And what the nurses talked about was the cumbersome nature of the post-operative care. Patients were still on infusions. Patients had to be observed very carefully because their blood thinners were still working uh, for several hours. Um, we solved that sort of problem by engineering very short half-life drug, uh, by uh, studying very carefully the throughput of patients so that the improvement in performance came from a completely unexpected area because we were thinking about outcomes rather than in inputs. Um, we had every bit as good protection against that second heart attack, but we could get the patient treated more quickly, more safely, which was very novel. As a consequence, we entered the market fourth with Angiomax against some very, very formidable competitors with excellent drugs. And I think within five years, we had 70% market share. It became the number one selling drug in US hospitals for many, many uh, years. And uh, you know, really drove the growth of the medicines company into an entity that investors thought was worth uh, investing in. And I know we spent a lot of time together back in those days as well, uh, working on some of those uh, products with you. Uh, you know, developing that outcome mindset. And you know, uh, we experienced with the rest of your team uh, and saw how you know the team sometimes struggled to go from the uh, left to right to right to left mindset. Um, how did you manage that? And how did you impart, how did you get people to change that mindset and, and align in the, in the same direction? It, it, it was very challenging, even in a small company like ours, which was much easier to create purpose in a small company than a very large company, much easier to create alignment, much easier to dismantle legacy ideas and put new ones in. But even, even though uh, my job was much easier in that regard than when I was in a big pharma company, uh, it, it was still it was still challenging. I, I think that um, the the word purpose, you know, is is often uh, synonymous with healthcare, and I think um, you know there are many great companies that have clearly put purposeful contribution to health above above anything. I mean, the famous uh, J and J Credo, for example, but other other companies too. It's it's rare that you'll come across a healthcare company that doesn't lead with that idea. But it is not that easy to put into action. 
I, I think you have to walk the talk all the time and ask the question, what are we really trying to do? And, you know, we're, we're trying to save lives. We're trying to alleviate suffering. And we're trying to improve the economics of care so that more people can be treated or cared for with the same or less uh, resource exposure. So I think you've got to begin whatever you're in with a very, very strong commitment to that sense of purpose, because without that, you don't have a true north on your outcome-driven thinking. Uh, so I, I think that's where we began. And, and honestly, it, it was not that hard to imagine, not that hard to execute. Where, where, we, where we lacked um, abilities, we didn't have the skills. Uh, Tony, frankly, we didn't know these tools. We'd all been brought up in good old fashioned market research. I myself had run many focus groups when I was at Roche, uh, you know, the kind where you um, put a profile of a drug. This is the drug we're thinking of developing. What do you think? And as you well know, they tell you what you think. Uh, and they tell you what you, you th excuse me, they tell you what they think you want to hear. Uh, and so you get a kind of a rather odd amount of information about uh, what customers uh, think and what they believe. You also get the mishmash of, of, of future statements from customers where you say, in what proportion of your patients are you likely to use this? And they say, oh, about 30% and about 50%, which of course is a, a rather wild guess. And, and frankly, even experts, even doctors and nurses and administrators in hospitals are guessing when they say that because it's much more complex. So um, by being purposeful and by saying that's not what we're going to do, you, you, you get off to a good start. But then you need the tools and techniques. Um, we None of us had been trained. So we took two of our most successful and important executives. We asked them to commit a year or, or 18 months to this. And frankly, we got them trained in, in methods that you taught us. Uh, and, and this was no small thing because we were taking two of our best people out of their normal leadership roles and saying, you're going to lead this movement in the company. And that was not popular with all of my colleagues because they were obviously losing two of their best uh, thought partners for for day-to-day -day work. They then built a team of 30 people within the firm who were all um, representing a cross-section from sales reps to um, uh, scientists and we expected everyone to learn the method. And then they in turn taught the whole eight or 900 person organization uh, about ODI, about outcomes driven or, or, or right to left thinking, if, if you want to call it that. We had an innovation framework that we used for it. We'd always had that, but the specific tools and techniques uh, of uh, you know, designing, understanding the job to be done, understanding the, the broad steps, going into minute details of the intermediary steps of any job, and really setting about the question, if this job could be done better, what kind of innovations would be needed? And um, we then applied it to our portfolio. We, we, we simply said, this is going to replace all uh, of our um, current market research. I mean, at the time, for example, we were probably spending about 15 to $20 million a year on conventional market research weaponry and ammunition. And uh, we just said, we're not gonna spend that anymore. We're gonna spend it uh, in a different way. So th these, these shifts are not easy because there are many people with budgets and with mindsets that wanna do it the same way they've always done it because uh, at least ostensibly, it can sometimes look like it's been successful. But I, I think the the change at the medicines company as we've embraced this was profound. Suddenly, our research people were loving marketing and our marketing people were loving research. And, and you know, there's nothing better than having interdisciplinary groups learning about um, innovation opportunity together because then they get committed to it and you really start to cook uh, towards your purpose. So... A lot of cultural shift, a lot of arguments, a lot of rows in conference rooms, but we got there and um, and the whole company got turned on. So that's great. So if an aspiring leader uh, were to ask you about the two most important things they should do to grow their business, would it be safe to say something like, uh, number one, develop an outcome-based mindset, and two, 
align the organization around those outcomes? Can we narrow it down or is to something like that? Well, no, you no, you wouldn't be trying to put words in my mouth, would you? Um, no, of course not. I, I, I actually think that's quite reasonable. I would add something, though, which is trust building, which is common to them both. Um, you know, I think uh, trust in, in, in healthcare, actually trust in any business, but I, I think we can all probably agree that trust in healthcare, given what's at stake for our uh, families, uh, our children, our grandparents, uh, you know, our best friends, um, being able to trust what happens in healthcare is really important. So since um, an outcome-based mindset, as you put it, and alignment of, of, of the organization around, around those outcomes, uh, both, I think, build trust between, between uh, colleagues, but also with the outside world that you're trying to interact with. I mean, by necessity, you have to listen uh, very, very hard, not to what customers believe or think or prognosticate, but what they do. Uh, 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 because they're expert in what they do, they're not so much experts any more than we are in what the future holds. When you sit down with anybody and say, tell me about your day, tell me about this, you know, this procedure, tell me about this disease, what do you have to do to deal with it? You start listening to customers in a very different way. You're not asking them for their opinion, you're asking them for their true expertise. And I think that builds trust there. And I think internally as well, when scientists and commercially minded people get in a room together and start asking fundamental questions about what happens in a business process at a customer or what happens when a product is deployed by a, by a customer, rather than what everybody thinks about it, I think that's very trust building. For me, uh, you know, the two things you mentioned, um, the outcome based mindset and the alignment uh, bring bring about four things uh, in turn: uh, competence, uh, a sense of knowing what's going on uh, accurately and and with data, uh, uh, a certain consistency. Because especially if you adopt this approach as we did systematically in the organization, you can develop uh, the the outputs that are, that are you know the charts, the the, the data, the analyses that allow everyone to see opportunities in a disciplined way. I mean, is there really an innovation opportunity here or is it just, uh, are we just guessing? Um, so consistency, I think transparency is, is dramatically improved. Uh, you know, we built, uh, as you know, we built uh, experience studios at our company where we literally uh, built uh, something that would look like the set of a movie, an operating room, a cath lab, an emergency room, where we literally walked through the use of the products before we built them uh, uh, to actually see what would it be like using this in the real world? What, what, what are those innovation opportunities that we, we are identifying, are they real? Uh, a lot of emergency room medicine, as you know, is very time-based, for example. So you know, if something's gonna take half an hour, you can forget it. Uh, uh, so, so a high level of transparency. And then of course, you know, when you talk this way about real things, that are happening with real products in real situations rather than guesses uh, and, and looking at the op opportunities in an orderly, almost mathematical way, um, you, 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 you automatically also create mutuality between the different stakeholders, whether they're internal stakeholders, as I said, between the scientists and the commercial guys or the regulatory guys, but also of course, you know, drag your customers into your simulation suite and ask them uh, to find out whether this theory of, uh, of an improvement in an innovation is true or not. That's excellent. Excellent. And so it, it really is a shift in mindset. And I, I was wondering uh, also, you know, how did that contribute or did it contribute to that 41% premium that the medicines company received when it was acquired by Novartis? Did they praise, did they see that you had a different uh, approach to innovation? I, I believe so. Uh, it's, it's, it's always difficult. Uh, to know exactly what's in the mind of a purchaser or an acquirer. Uh, but I think that um, by the time we, we uh, were sold to Novartis, we were working on a product for high cholesterol, uh, which is, of course, a, a huge 
driver of risk in heart disease. And there, uh, Tony, we had worried for years about the problem of adherence or persistence. Uh, as you know, um, uh, a lot of people might be prescribed uh, drugs to lower their bad cholesterol, such as statins, and they may take them for a while, but by the end of one year, 50 to 60% of patients or, or people taking these kinds of drugs uh, have stopped taking them for no good reason other than you know, the humanity of it. And we asked the question, not could we build, could we create a more powerful lowering, statin, um, a more powerful um, cholesterol lowering drug? We, we, it's certainly rather like the blood thinning story. It had to be powerful enough. But the real question was, would people uh, and could we help them be more adherent to their therapy? We came up with the idea that by using a very new technology called small interfering RNA, which was Nobel Prize winning science from 2006, uh, that's when the Nobel was awarded, could we take that technology and deliver a drug once or twice a year by the doctor at your routine visit and you wouldn't have to take any more tablets uh, for the rest of the year? Because we have great drugs for lowering cholesterol, statins particularly, but we're human and we don't take them for very long. Um, and we wanted to, 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 to innovate on that axis rather than you know, greater potency. And again, I think that, that came from our outcomes thinking. That, that, that came from a mindset of what's the real problem here? What can we really solve? What the job to be done, and we, in our, in our product development plans, we used to have you know, a paragraph at the beginning on, on job to be done. In this case, I can't quote it verbatim, but it was basically, we want people to lower their cholesterol for their entire life. Um, the idea that, for example, you say, we want to lower cholesterol by 60% is really useless because if 60% for a week or a month or even a year in a lifetime is completely inadequate in, in terms of protecting patients. It was a lot, we had to find a way of getting people uh, a lifetime commitment and in medicine, there's a term, and in some other disciplines too, called disutility. Disutility, of course, means inconvenience and cost. And so anything in your health that is awkward to do or inconvenient or, or costs you money, you're less likely to do. So we, we were attacking the innovation problem, not from some fantastic new technology, although we were using fabulous new technology, but it was the problem to solve was lower disutility have people being able to do this for their lifetime, not for six months. And, and, and that really was, I think that did capture uh, the imagination of the senior leadership at Novartis who were very uh, creative people. Um, the, it also allowed us to have started negotiating and even landing some deals because the product we were working on, the, the main product was quite advanced. Uh, we, we, for example, <clears throat> undertook and signed a, a contract with the British government for the entire population of the UK, uh, in which uh, we were able to offer the, uh, you know, the opportunity for higher adherence in a population uh, in return for them committing to a certain minimum amount of goods. And then in return, uh, we would um, you know, commit to a very attractive price. And then in return for that, uh, they committed to incentivizing physicians by paying them every time they use this drug. Uh, by the way, if I did that, it would be considered inappropriate, but in a managed healthcare system, that's considered you know, appropriately incentivizing physicians to do the right thing. So lots of win-wins came out of the mindset and that, that deal is considered something of a landmark in, in the UK and is now, I think, being used as a model for multiple new deals with cancer diagnostics, cancer drugs that, that others are now doing in the UK and also beginning to talk about quite seriously with, uh, with US payers, which is, of course, a whole different situation because the US is such a fragmented market. Yeah. Well, congratulations again on the sale to Nevada. I know that was quite an accomplishment. And, uh, but that's not the end of the story, Clive. It's, it's almost the beginning um, because, you know, as we've spoken before, uh, you've been very busy since the sale. Uh, you started a company called Population Health, 
And you shared with me a, a, a different view of, of pharma, uh, your vision of pharma. Uh, and uh, you, you know, we sometimes talk about it as the the VW version of pharma versus the Lamborghini version of <laughs> pharma. Uh, I'd love for you to uh, explain that to the audience and uh, talk about the mission of population health and how you help it to achieve that goal. Yeah, indeed. Uh, thanks for that opportunity. You know, as you mentioned in my introduction, I trained in cancer treatment and research, and I'm thrilled with the progress we've been making in, in cancer treatments uh, in the last 30 years. Um, it's it's setwise. It's I used to say it's like moving Mount Everest with a toothpick, but it, it's real progress, and there's been some tremendous improvements in survival, in quality of life, uh, and um, and, and even a few a few cures here and there, in, particularly in the leukemias, for example, and lymphomas, which we didn't necessarily have 30, 40, 50 years ago. Um, on the other hand, the business model that's gone with all of this has become rather boutique-y. Let, let me give you some data. So in the year 2000, the top 10 drugs, uh, or top 10 brands in pharmaceuticals worldwide, on an inflation-adjusted basis to 2020, uh, sold about $35 billion. Uh, um, Prilosec, which is now available over the counter, was the number one prescription drug in the world in 2020, and it sold about $6 billion. The other nine of the top 10 uh, made up the rest of, of the 35 or so billion. And, um, you know, they were drugs like statins. They were drugs like Prozac and Paxil, which are for anxiety and depression. But almost... Uh, without uh, exception, they were tablets, pills um, that we took once a day, twice a day, uh, and um, they were mostly small molecules. This was really before the biotech uh, revolution had really kicked in, although there were some biologicals already available, of course, uh, but they were relatively infrequent. Those top 10 brands in America could have addressed uh, diseases or conditions of 120 million people in this country. So about, you know, around a third of the population could have used one of those top 10. Uh, and many did, and many used more than one. Um, why in the tape forward to 2020, and it's been a progression, we've looked at every year. Uh, in fact, the top 10 brands worldwide in 2020 sold 96 billion. It's not shocking that, um, even after adjusting for inflation, you know, prices go up. Uh, although it is a bit of a unique phenomenon to pharmaceuticals. I mean, on an inflation uh, basis, you know, has the cell phone got more expensive? Not really. Um, it's got a whole lot more features, it's got a lot better. I remember buying a cell phone 25 years ago for my uh, wife, a uh, very fancy one by Bang & Olufsen of all people, and it was like 1100 bucks. Um, so even some technologies come down in price, but not pharma. It's, it's actually gone up. Um, but what is very shocking for people is not that it's two and a half times as much spending on the top 10 brands. It's that we now can only use those brands in about 18, one eight million Americans because we've targeted boutique illnesses with those brands. Now, if you multiply two and a half times increased spending uh, and six to seven times uh, decreased uh, potential users, you have a, a factor about 16 or 17, which happens to be the exact ratio of the inflation adjusted price of a Volkswagen Jetta to a, to a pretty decent Lamborghini. Uh, and in fact, that's what's happened in our industry is that we have moved generally to become a boutique industry. Um, whereby the top 10 brands in the world now, led by a drug called Humira, which is a fantastic drug for rheumatoid disease and some other inflammatory illnesses, and Keytruda, which is a wonderful entry in the world of cancer, are available, but can only be used by very few people compared with what we used to be. Uh, remember, five to six fold reduction in the target audience that our current top 10 drugs aim at. Now, is that a bad thing? Not necessarily if you're in that 18 million people that need a Lamborghini, if you like, that, 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 that need a very, very, very uh, remarkable drug. But it means that we haven't been innovating in the 
frequent diseases, uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, um, anxiety and depression, uh, asthma, um, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. The, the, you mentioned the seven. The top 10 drugs, uh, excuse me, conditions that we know will kill 80% of humans in the next 100 years, we already know what they are. There's a, there's a, a very well-constructed global program called the Global Burden of Disease Study. We know exactly what's going to be killing us. Um, it's the things that have been killing us for the last 100 years. It actually isn't uh, true that, you know, leukemia is going to kill most humans. Now, there's nothing wrong with the progress in leukemia. I love it. But we've ignored uh, these large population disorders. Now, it, it, it's true we have some new drugs here and there, but we've looked at the global industry pipeline. There's about 9,000 clinical programs underway in the world. They are heavily skewed for the future towards these rare and important but rare diseases um, and important but rare, relatively rare cancers and away from uh, the common diseases like heart disease, metabolic disease, diabetes, lung disease. Now, if you want to think briefly about what happens when you fail to address the underlying common ailments of humanity, uh, we just have to look back on the incredible death toll, morbidity and costs of, 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 of our COVID pandemic, in which, you know, if you imagine that uh, we raised, we, we lowered, should I say, the average cholesterol of the country by 10 milligrams, which is not much, or we lowered the average glycosylated hemoglobin level of the by 0.1%, that, that's a marker of diabetes, uh, then probably the amount of suffering, mortality, and, and cost of COVID would have been different. The underlying health of our population really, really matters all the time. It especially matters when you have things like COVID flying around. These are the big drivers of cost. And if the Volkswagen Group were to announce tomorrow that they were moving in a 20 year cycle, they were gonna move out of all Volkswagen brands and even out of Porsche and only sell Lamborghinis, we'd, we'd say that's crazy. That's, a, that's, that's gonna solve the traffic problem in New York, but it's not gonna solve the transportation problem. That's the, the situation farmers in and population health partners, we've created that uh, with an eye on ESG investing, of course, impact investing, uh, to try to redress or take the industry a little bit back uh, to our roots, which is dealing with very large diseases more often. Otherwise, we're going to have market failures, and uh, we can't afford that. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, the, if we put that through our uh, jobs to done growth strategy filter, we'd say uh, you're trying to pursue a dominant strategy. You want to get the job done better and more cheaply than it's getting done currently for large populations. You know, looking at that large population disorder, I mean, uh, that has to be just a great target to go after and a great strategy to use. I, I think I think for an investment slash operating company, which is what we've now created, it, it, it's, it is. Uh, and we've been gratified by the enthusiasm that we've met from you know, pension funds, uh, from sovereign wealth funds, who obviously are now looking at deploying capital uh, for excellent returns, but also uh, you know, in a way that's purposeful to solve some of the world's uh, big problems. So uh, there's no doubt that Big Pharma will swing its way back to this and in some places already is, and COVID will accelerate that, but we uh, aim to be you know, the leading investor in, in, in population health problems going forward. And by the way, in order to provide the same returns on capital or equity that the rare diseases and boutique diseases uh, 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 can offer. Obviously, the unit profitability is lower, the margins are lower. And so the process of development, the process of manufacturing, and the process of commercialization have to be more efficient. Otherwise, you can't return the capital, which is why we got out of these places in the first place. So we have a lot to do. Uh, this is not going to be easy. But uh, the good news, last thing I'll say on it is that assets in the population health space are incredibly undervalued, relative to assets in the oncology, rare disease, and um, 
immunology space where there's so many people pursuing it, putting um, ownership prices up um, and the markets are getting crowded and uh, you know, it's getting very, very tough to, to win. Uh, we think that, that, that we're running into a, a space which is in relative terms for our investors more attractive as well. I'd love to talk to you more about that in the future. So uh, we'll definitely talk about that. Uh, I, there's one other comment. I was just listening to you talk about, uh, you know, how you target um, markets to go after. And it goes back to the medicines company. It appears as, uh, you know, each of the, well, the two key successes that you talked about there uh, prevented things from getting worse at a high level, right? So it prevents people from having another heart attack after they're right. already had a heart attack. And, uh, and th that's a great approach, right? Because uh, I, th I think everyone may be trying to prevent things from happening to begin with, but early on- well, you're preventing I, I, I think you've put your finger on a very important point. We know that what we do to our bodies between the age of 15 and 40 is the recipe for what's gonna to happen to you after you're 60. Uh, for chronic diseases. We know uh, increasingly what genetic markers that we can know from the moment we're born, even before we're born potentially, uh, might put us at increased risk over and above our environment, over and above our behaviors. If you put those three together, and, and that's, this is where biology is so exciting right now, you can unpack those things. And you know, by the age of 20, you can have a recipe uh, for a series of smart interventions, which may be as simple as taking more time to work out, it, it may not be that simple, which can actually provide for a much healthier population going forward. This has always been the dream of population health as a discipline. And I think if we take across some of the marvelous biology we've unpacked for cancer and rare disease and start applying it with some of the new interventions we've also learned, I think we could actually uh, transform uh, longevity, transform quality of life, uh, the way we interact with our families and friends, and of course, uh, our, our performance as humans, our ability to add value to the world. So it's a very exciting time to make this transition, uh, as you say, to really get after preventing things happening. You know, I was reading a, a post in LinkedIn the other day, someone asked, who is the Elon Musk of pharma? And they were looking for an answer. And I'm thinking, after listening to what you're saying here, uh, if if you have these successes, wouldn't that make you the Elon Musk of pharma? Well, I, I, Elon is incomparable, and I would never even imagine being that good. But uh, <laughs> if if we could get some inspiration from him, that would be great because I think he himself is is is, is making some efforts in healthcare. I think all of the big players are. We, you know, Apple obviously is hugely in it. Uh, I'm glad to say. Uh, Amazon. A everyone knows this is the challenge of the next 100 years, this global warming, a few other things that we've got on our plate. But the healthcare opportunities now, based upon what we've learned the last 30 to 50 years, are extraordinary. We've just got to be courageous and say, uh, let's look at what problems really need solving. Let's not just assume that technology is the only answer. 